Yeah, so this is our building uh, and it serves a couple purposes. It is, um, it's actually an historical building and this building was the first children's hospital in the Middle East in the late 1800s. And a German aristocrat who was a physician opened up here a, a free medical clinic for uh, the children of Jerusalem and the surrounding vill villages. And at the time, really, it was um, almost like a public health crisis. There was really poor sanitation and infrastructure for health. But anyways, the building today serves somewhat the same purpose because it houses children that come to Israel for open heart surgeries. And the children are from uh, Gaza Strip and also from Iraq. And um, in their home situation, they can't find the, the care to get an open heart surgery that they need to live. Um, so there's a bunch of Israeli doctors that, that are volunteering their expertise and even their equipment to do free uh, open heart surgeries and then this building serves as like a Ronald McDonald house um, as, as before and after the surgery for recuperation and um, also our community lives here we're, uh, we're a community of Christians and we live uh, in this building uh, together there's about 15 of us um, some are from uh, from the area local Israelis and some are international like myself and um, so the building is kind of like this uh, little climate of activity and and a lot of children are running around, um, especially after surgery, once they're feeling a little bit better. And um, this is where in the back garden right now. And um, so upstairs is where the children live. They come to Israel with their mothers usually, and they're usually in the country for probably about a couple months. Um, and only one week really needs to be in the hospital under direct medical supervision. And then for seven weeks, they just need a place to convalesce and to be under uh, medical supervision, but not really like an ICU. So that's the upstairs of this house. And then downstairs is our administrative offices because, um, you know, of course, we need to find um, passport stuff for these children. We need to find the funds for these children. We need to, there's a lot of uh, logistics between point A and point B to get sick child on good uh operating table. So that's the purpose of this building and and, uh, and I've been uh, working here for about a year and a half. So. Yeah, I came uh, to Israel as a graduate student doing a semester abroad uh, studying um, philosophy and, and religion and um, wanted to do that in a place that where those are real things not just abstractions and um, before I began my graduate studies I broke my neck in a pretty dramatic car accident and um, you know, the whole the whole thing, helicopter ride uh, to a couple hospitals to take a bone out of my hip, put it in my neck, and it's pretty traumatic for me. Um, and so I think uh, when I came here studying, and now questions of philosophy are more personal, not just queries, and then I encounter these kids that themselves are in this place of gray between life and death, and they're having a major operation where their, you know, important organs are being opened up man, it just resonated with me. And last year I actually got to see an open heart surgery of this little girl named Fatima. She's five, she's from Iraq. And um, for five hours I stood with the Israeli doctors as they opened her up like a mashed potato and, and worked on her organ of life. And it was so profound. Um, so I love that. I, I just, um, I feel a resonance, I guess, from my own biography with children themselves. And, and also I feel, um, as a Christian, I feel like um, the concept of God's love uh, that I've received compels me to to to, um, to become a loving person and to love my neighbor in practical ways, and so this is my this is my attempt at that. I came to Israel as like a tourist when I was 18, a senior in high school, and uh, it just awakened some things in me. And principally, I mean, just kind of the whole field of my current interest, which is humanities, philosophy, history. Um, literature, all those things, but really kind of um, prominent in that new cluster of interest was Hebrew. All of a sudden I was like, wow, this is, this is a new way to express myself. It's beautiful. And, and it wasn't just a new language, it was a new logic. Because Hebrew employs a totally different um, way of looking at the world. And I thought that was really interesting. But I remember standing, so I, I wandered into a little store and picked up like a Hebrew grammar, like I learned Hebrew for dummies or something. And I just remember being like, there's no way I could learn this. This is just beyond me. It's too huge. I think I instinctively understood at the beginning that a language is enormous. And I was like, I can't do it. But then it's when I went back uh, to my home, uh, public high school up in the Rockies of Montana, I was just still interested. And, and one day I decided to act on it and use my lunch break to go poke around online to find some Hebrew. And it kind of became my habit. The spring of my senior year, I would just kind of sneak off to the library at lunch and, and study 
um, study some Hebrew. And even now, I'm actually really surprised by how much Hebrew I was able to pick up in those early self-tutorial days. I mean, you can really you can really learn a lot just on your own if you're willing to kind of put the dots together and stick with it. And so, yeah, that's that's where I got my beginning. And, and ever since, I'm 20, I turn 24 next month. And ever since, it's it's just been, um, it's not a subject in school. It's just kind of a, it's, it's just a hobby. It's a way of life. And, uh, and I'm thankful for it. It really enriches me. You know, I was a really poor Spanish student. And I think that's an important part of my story. My first attempts at language learning in high school were, fell pretty flat. I, uh, I, I barely scraped by with uh, adequate grades. Didn't like it either. And I think that's really the big thing for me. The reason I found success in Hebrew is because success is secondary to me. I enjoy it. And, um, you know, if, if there was no class, there was no grade, I'd still like it. And I think that that's really critical to the reason why I've, I have done well in the, in the academic setting. It's because the academic setting's not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. And I just enjoy the language. And so that, that's, that's been the tale of the tape why I was at one point a mediocre student. And now I'm a stronger student because I found something that I love and go after it. And that's, that's been important to me. Yeah. Well, I have an advantage in that like my regular life here work involves Hebrew. So it's not an artificial discipline for me. It's very genuine and I need it. Um, so I really actually look at my studies at the university, which are pretty focused, but as an augmentation to, to my real purpose, which is to be able to function with Hebrew. And so, um, no, I don't have a tutor. I, um, my, my theory is to have authentic situations of using the language. Um, but, but really good um, instruction with someone that's able to help you, that's been really important to me. Because sometimes you'll have certain lingering questions about grammar or certain um, points that you want clarified, or you just need repetition of certain things, you know? And that's where the classroom setting can be really good, or study partners. Um, but the best thing is that my roommate just speaks Hebrew. So every day, the first words that I'm saying are in Hebrew. My last thoughts at night are expressed in Hebrew. And I don't know, aren't there some studies about um, your, your mind has more receptivity to the things uh, right before and after sleep? I think that helps too, maybe. Language isn't something that's just meant for the academy. Language is something that's just meant to express. It's zing, it's life, it's opinion, it's everything. So when I ask regular people, that's the best because you can just get regular answers and the regular answers are the real ones. <laughs> um, so we're in the courtyard uh, of our building and one of the biggest laboratories of Hebrew learning for me is uh, Israeli tour groups that come here because this building um, was a children's hospital. So a lot of people are interested in it. And so a couple times a week, this courtyard will be filled with like, you know, 40, 50 Israelis. And it's up to me to, uh, to explain to them for 10 minutes in Hebrew what we're about, to answer questions. And if you've ever been to Israel, you know that people are just firing questions about five at a time. And so, to, you know, to try to be poised in another language. Um, it's a blast, actually. It, it, it feels intimidating and I still get nervous every time beforehand. But once it gets rolling, I just love it. And, and you just realize, too, after you're starting to talk in Hebrew, you're not thinking about the Hebrew, you're just communicating. And you're just using a complete different set of uh, symbols to communicate, but you're just communicating. It's not, it's not freaky. Were you ever tempted to get up? Were you... Uh... Sh sure, I think you're, you're embarrassed, <laughs> to be quite honest. You just feel kind of stupid. Um, especially in a setting where English is so common and, and it's easy to revert to the easy thing because the person you're talking to speaks better English than, than your ability in their language. But um, it's been extremely rewarding to me when I'm willing to persevere and to just, just kind of draw a line in the sand and be like, look, I'm in this country and this is the language I'm speaking. And I think when you make that um, known to people, they really respond positively. Like it's um, it's encouraging to them that you take the interest in their language, and that it, you're not you're not mocking them. You're genuinely trying. And um, as I've pushed through some points of resistance, and honestly, they come almost on a daily basis. Almost every time I walk into the store, I'm like, okay, am I going to just go for it in English, or should I uh, really attempt the Hebrew? And every time I attempt the Hebrew, I come out just feeling really glad that I did, and and encouraged. And y you learn a few new words. And you know, your linguistic scientist will say how many times that you need to encounter a word in order to remember it. But you need to encounter it a lot less times when you get it wrong to remember it. So you make a few um, epic mistakes and you'll remember those words too. So it's a, it's a really good, um, it's good pedagogy to go into the, uh, just, to, just to immerse yourself and to go for it. So what have, what have been um, strategies that you have used when you... Um 
don't feel like doing Hebrew? How, how do you get yourself back in the saddle? I think just to not take myself so seriously and to just, um, and to be okay with messing up. It, it, um, and, and to remind myself why I'm learning Hebrew and it's because I enjoy it. It's, um, you know, that's a good question. I don't know what my strategies are other than just to be a Montana cowboy and get her done. <laughs> I mean, I don't really know beyond that. <laughs>